record. Got it. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, hello. <laughs> We've already <laughs> been talking. No, I, I usually do these recordings really um, low tech. Like we're basically I um, put a cover slide on what we're recording right now. I don't edit anything um, because I just don't have the time. Um, no, that's absolutely fine. I just wanted to check that my sound level was okay. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, how are you? Really lovely to um, finally have this conversation with you. I, I'm so happy we are. And it's springtime. So there's something bubbling up um, mm -hmm. that I'm feeling very energized by and loving being out in the garden. And yeah, I'm good. Thank you. It's good to okay. see you. Yeah, the, the, the spring is just oh, like spring has been on, on its way here in on Mallorca for, for quite some time. And we're actually just sensing into oh this doesn't feel like spring anymore this is a bit early for for summer heat to come but um it's just so lovely to see that like when all that potential that has been sitting there in the darkness um of the winter suddenly go because like the buds start swelling and then poof, the first leaves come out and i've I, this spring has been magical for me so um really really connect with that brilliant brilliant we have so much that we could talk about, but I would, uh, before we get into, whoops, ah, this doesn't work when you share, that. I'm trying to hold up your book, but the weird virtual background won't let me. I, uh, I can do it. Whoa. Ah, yeah, that one. You know? <laughs> that yeah. one. <laughs> so, it, before we go into this, I think it would be just lovely to, to have you tell your story a bit. I know you've been asked that many times so i like maybe with a different angle in terms of how did you put strings onto the harp that you're now so eloquently playing with the different stages of your life um and how did that inner calling develop of just saying yeah like i'm here for a reason I have a uniqueness in myself that can be of service to the whole that brought me forth. And um, I'm going to use this opportunity of this lifetime to the best um, that I can use it, because that's clearly what you're doing. Um, how, how did you get into that regenerative mode <laughs> of connecting to life's regenerative impulse? <laughs> Oh, I think a lifetime of curiosity actually has been the breadcrumbs that sort of invited me on this journey. I mean, I really have this sense of, and we talked about this before we started recording, and I've had many, many life lessons <laughs> where I've gone into the, as my mum used to say when I was getting a bit above myself, get over yourself, just get over yourself. And there was a time um, possibly 20 years ago, when I'd realized at that point that I was here to serve in, in some way. And I sort of, you know, fell into that, that sense of, of a mission. I'm mm -hmm. here to serve. I'm here to serve. And there were a number of situations that really got me over that <laughs> um, to a point when I realized that the, the, the lightest service can be the most profound service mm -hmm. where I take what I do seriously, but I don't take myself seriously. And that I feel has sort of got us to this conversation in, in many ways. But the journey began when I was very young. When I was four or thereabouts, um, I started to both have visions and hear voices. And as a four-year-old, that's the most natural thing in the world, probably. Mm -hmm. But that's been a an experiential way of perceiving the world that's been with me ever since. So I sometimes describe it as walking between worlds, but what it's done is it's given me the most incredible journey of, of this earth walk for mm -hmm. me um, along that journey of curiosity. You know, what is the nature of reality? You know, the, 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 the sort of the trivial questions, who am I, where am I from? Yeah, all of that. Mm -hmm. But it's been an incredible journey of curiosity and joy and it's it's enabled me over those years, and in many ways, I, I thought what you said was beautiful to string the bow, as it were, mm -hmm. you know, of of the of the the, the instrument um, of my service because it has involved ancient wisdom, indigenous teachings, leading edge science, 
the nature of consciousness. And more and more, as those strings have come together, have converged into this you know, unified understanding or perspective that I now share, um, it's actually brought me to a place where I've realized that perhaps this convergent, unitive narrative where leading edge science and all of these wisdom teachings are now come together to reveal that, you know, unity isn't an aspiration or a hope, but is our existential reality in my perspective expressed in diversity. What does that mean for us? What could we do if we can heal our worldview of separation into a worldview of wholeness mm -hmm. and, and, and behave and choose and act from that? wholeness in diversity rather than a fragmentation so now it's more about an activism andrew harvey dear friend calls it sacred activism but it's almost like an evolutionary activism mm -hmm. that isn't about them and us or what's wrong and problem solving it's about we're all us <laughs> and we belong to a whole world and what does that mean in the sense of potential building i think you talk about spreading rather than scaling you know what is it or what could it be and if we come from this perspective it's fascinating because it really comes to um like even in, in your own journey because you you, you you if i get it right you did have a career in business and yeah. you also had a career as a physicist um and the, but but then what you just said about from four years on the the experiential reality, um, yeah. that's precisely what I think we've been missing in Western culture that led to this narrative of separation, is that we have um, slowly had a creeping through science and the the narrative of science, a creeping into a world where only the analytical thinking mind as access to knowledge about the participation in this nested wholeness that we emerged from was valid. And on top of it, this story of the so-called objective observer started to not just be a scientific dogma, but also became a cultural uh, dogma that there is like, like be objective. Yeah? <laughs> um, and, um, it's precisely like I, I find in, in recent years, in, in the first time I heard about this was through my uh, friend and mentor, Stefan Harding at Schumacher College. Um, he, he taught us about Jung's mandala of the four ways of knowing. And I, I go on about it a lot because I think it's, a, it's, it's, it's really um, useful for people to understand that when we speak about our potential as, as beings, um, we really shortchange ourselves by measuring and understanding and looking at ourselves through only one of the four ways of knowing and sensing, feeling, and intuiting the, the participatory direct knowing because you're not separate from, but an expression of, and therefore your access to is so much larger because <laughs> it's not something out there. Eh? Um, and I think this is this is the big journey we now need to take because it's also the journey that brings Western science back into the indigenous ancient wisdom that that has brought us here and the the birthright of our species as a bioregional custodian species that does what life does, create conditions conducive to life. Um, and it, in and the other bit um, that which relates to your book is we're sort of waking up through science and through remembering ancient wisdom and through all the crises on a planetary scale that that, that, that we've triggered, that um, it's, it's kind of logical that to look at life, yes, it's valid to talk about individuals and to talk about species and to sort of understand how they interact. And But all of these are the categories of mind. Um, the it's just as valid, and you could build just mu as much of a science about this to say this whole thing, 
life is a planetary process, possibly a cosmic process, that manifests in these basically just like mushroom fruit bodies in an mycelium that that is that's what what eternal life immortality and all the wisdom traditions is about to understand that life is immortal not not again the the kind of skin encapsuled ego trip of i want to be immortal but anyway they, they, I, th I think we resonate on, on on so many levels and and in, in many ways what i just sort of in my language is is what you're talking about in in this book um so how did the book came about come about Wow. Well, um, about 20 years ago, um, I was given um, a, a, a guidance that at some point I, I would write. And, and at that point, I had never written anything, essentially. But I was, in, except I was in the middle of a PhD on, on archaeology. So I was writing in a very um, academic way, my, my sort of dissertation, my thesis. But I was given that I would be writing books. And, and, you know, I, I sort of say, that's great, and put it aside. And I have written a number of books before this particular book, The Story of Gaia. But at that time, I was told that at some point I was would write a trilogy of books mm -hmm. and that they would serve the understanding, experiencing, and embodying of unity awareness or unity of consciousness. And again, that's lovely, um, whenever that might be. But I was also given the three titles of the trilogy. And the first was The Cosmic Hologram. Um, and in fact, in 2017, I did write The Cosmic Hologram, which was, you know, 15 years or more after this, this insight that this would come at some point. Um, and that is very much setting out the sort of the leading edge science that is, as you say, Daniel, is, is actually founded, grounded in ancient wisdom and especially ancient Indian wisdom of the Vedas and, and uh, the Upanishads of the nature of consciousness and the, the nature of the world, but bringing leading edge science into this. So I wrote that in 2017. And then I wasn't a sense of writing this bit, the second of the trilogy, the story of Gaia. But I was sort of preparing for it. It was like it was coming, but it wasn't ready yet. And it wasn't ready until the pandemic came. And then for the first time in many years, I was actually at home and I was settling in and I was in very much a, a hearing and listening space. And the book began to write me at that point because I don't feel that I wrote it. It wrote me and it was coming. And so um, the first book is really, you know, the cosmology of essentially a, a living, evolving universe and the, the science, that the, mainly the physics, but the science around that. But the second book, The Story of Guy, literally is the story of the evolutionary journey of our entire universe and our planetary home for the last 13.8 billion years from that very first moment of space and time and, and energy and matter that I renamed the big breath rather than the big bang. But mm -hmm. it, I began the book loving our world, loving Gaia. I completed the book in awe, in absolute awe of this journey and mm. the wonder of it and the magic of it and the the sheer genius, <laughs> the sheer genius of a universe mm. that could begin in its simplest form 13.8 billion years ago and has come to this complexity, this incredible abundance of our planetary home. And, and and to us and, and this conversation now. So it came out late last year and um, the third book is not yet ready to be written, mm -hmm. um, but I'm starting to feel it coming. Um, but that's the story of Gaia. And so it, as you were writing it, were you doing research into earth system science and all the, the, the story? And, and, and that's how you fell more in love with the, the story or what, what were the, the insights that particularly in, in your own journey of, of um, deepening into the matter to write about the book well, that, that really touched you about this, this long journey of life? Well, I guess it goes back to what I was saying earlier about curiosity. You know, curiosity is my middle name. 
So that curiosity has sort of taken me down many, many, many different fields of study, as well as the experiencing of, of all that I was mentioning earlier. So I've always been fascinated by evolutionary uh, biology and always, you know, from very early age, was uncomfortable about the way it was being taught. Mm-hmm. You know, the idea that, that evolution is, is driven by random mutations that never sat well with me. And, and certainly all the, the, the research that I've done over many, many years progressively sort of guided me in a different perspective of the nature of evolution. And of course, systems theory, because I've experienced reality essentially as a cosmic hologram, as a wholeness, multidimensional wholeness all my life, systems perspectives, whole systems perspectives have always, again, been a natural um, mm-hmm. way for me to perceive the the innate, not just interconnectedness, but foundational unity of, of the whole world and as is expressed in radical diversity. So for, me, for many, many decades before writing the story of Gaia, I'd, I'd researched, studied, mm-hmm. um, and followed the, the, the sort of the emergent understanding of this. Because when I began, of course, and you know this very, very well, the way we experienced the world was not how it has been taught. Mm. So not just physics, but all the sciences were very siloed, very much based on a reductionist model, very much based on a worldview of, of separation. So taking things apart to seeing what makes them up rather than realizing that they're inevitably part of a whole. So it's only been in the last, I don't know, decade, even the last few years, that more and more of the science and the scientific breakthroughs have realized and progressively acknowledged the unity expressed in diversity. And it's long, as we both know, it's an emergent journey. But nonetheless, that was why I was able to share these two books because the evidence that underpins them and frames them, it has only really been coming forward in the last few years. Yeah, well, through through those lenses. Um, I mean, I I did a master's in holistic science in 2001, 2002 at Schumacher College. And at the time, basically, that was the intent of that course when Brian Goodwin started the course in 1998. Um, they, I think they had in the first year, they had two students and we were still in a, in a cohort of um, nine students, but with Stefan Harding, Brian Goodwin, and a, our Spanish or Catalan tutor, Jordi Pijem, being in every session. And then we had all these visiting teachers bringing in a holistic understanding yeah. of participatory wholeness through angles like Goethe and science with Margaret Calhoun and Henry Bortoft and, and Craig Holdridge or Gaia theory with, with James Lovelock and, and, and Stefan Harding and um, Tim Lenton, and um, and then also complexity science through through Brian's back, uh, background. And, and so there, there was definitely already a, um, a set of theories, but now we have more evidence um, to back up those theories. Uh, um, but it's it's a very similar journey in that way. To do, it, 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 I just fell in love with, like I was always in love with this nested wholeness that I just like you um, always saw things through dynamic systems, not static systems, no. um, processes within processes, uh-huh. and um, and so it just. It, it, that, that's why being a scientist was always so frustrating because it, it literally hurt me physically when after studying elephant seals for three months on an Indian mitten on Anyanuevo State Park in California um, and then having to write about it, I felt I could speak about 10% of what I had experienced and knew because we only had selected those data points and only within those data points could we do the statistical analysis to express everything and this is the 1990s where in bi- in field biology if it didn't have a p-value attached to it you couldn't say it uh, um so yeah it's a, it's a, but it's i feel there's an opening starting to happen now within 
science. And like I've I've been working with um, Professor Tobias Lute at ETH Zurich on on a course where we're really trying to bridge exactly this bridge. How do we how do we value the amazing insights that we have in science, and at the same time, like and and, and the necessity of science as a as a as a means to access intersubjective consensus about the world. But then dethrone it from this false arrogance of it being the only access to the only val valid truth, and um, because it's it's a it's a real fine line. Because other like on the one hand, every, like you don't want to go into an everything goes. I had a vision now, all follow me. Um, but but um, you also want to listen to the vision to say maybe maybe it's informative. Let's hold it lightly. And see how it, it can inform us, in, instead of dismiss it, because we science has such a strong way, and culturally we've absorbed that, of very quickly dismissing things that come from that sensing, feeling, intuiting, embodied knowing, direct knowing perspective, that that at the same time science tells us that that's how scientific insight starts. Like most scientists have this embodied inside first and then they rationalize it afterwards yeah, to tell the scientific story around it so how, how like you you mainly entered into this through physics but then telling the story of Gaia is like the system's view of life as Fritjof Kapwa calls it is, is living biology um how how was that journey for you Ed? It, it was a very natural an unfolding journey because when I when the, the cosmic hologram when I wrote the cosmic hologram which was the cosmology of 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 a whole world view essentially of a living evolving universe the evolutionary aspect of it was was not emphasized it was you know that the whole dynamic yes story was there but it was from a cosmological perspective as a container essentially of this wondrous um, experiential world that we 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 are participating, but the story of evolution was was foundational to and is foundational to the story of Gaia because what I realised when writing the cosmic hologram is that our universe doesn't just exist and evolve as a non locally unified entity where mind and consciousness aren't something we have they're literally what we and the whole world are it actually embodies an evolutionary impulse, an impulse to evolve from simplicity to greater complexity, individuation, um, awareness, and all of this. So I wanted to tell the story of that incredibly evolutionary journey, you know, that began 13.8 billion years ago, as simple as it could be, but no simpler, as Einstein said, but I added a piece to fulfill its evolutionary impulse because that was coming through so powerfully. And in the story of Gaia, as, as you know, Daniel, I, I write that, that everything was set up from the very beginning, you know, the laws of physics, the fine tuning, the order, and then just right first time, the, the stories of just right first time literally um, occur throughout the whole of that nearly 14 billion year story. You know, DNA and analysis of DNA has shown that it's it's the most perfect um, informational template in terms of the sort of landscape of possibilities to the extent of something like one in a million. And it was right first time. It wasn't a practice to get it right over you know, millions or more years. DNA sort of came fully fitted for its perfection. And, you know, we have all the harbingers, not just of DNA and RNA, but all of the biological building blocks for biological organisms out in interstellar dust and gas clouds before our planetary system came into being. Mm. So this is the whole story over those billions of years of this um, sort of predication of more complexity to come. But that to come could take millions, in some cases, hundreds of millions of years before the circumstances and the unrolling of this experiential journey from simplicity to complexity was ready for the next step. 
So that's why I really wanted to to share this because it's such an incredible journey because it brings back meaning and purpose into our world because the science, the reductionist science of the perspective, I'm not blaming this because it's a journey we've all come on and it's opened up, you know, incredible insights into nature of reality. But it's it was that paradigm is a story of of accident, randomness, mm-hmm. meaninglessness, purposefulnessness, and and what this is now, and the evidence is now showing that our universe meaningfully exists and purposefully evolves, and that's the story I wanted to share in in the story of Gaia. Mm. Yeah, I mean. Th- th- I think it's a shared friend of ours, probably um, Brian Swim. You, you, you know, I, yeah. Brian and I are sort of working together. We hope now Lovely. a little more because there's well, with so much love complementarity. Love I will. Um, his work with with Thomas Berry and that whole mission and vision of how do we use science to reconnect people in awe with this magnificent being that we're an expression of um that that's so important work and 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 it's it's really fascinating to see how um kind of hard science research science is now more and more bringing up um pieces of a puzzle that allows us to tell the story in that way but but what i but i find interesting is is that um for me, one of the expressions or the, or the, 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 the more logical reasons for right first time is also that when you think of evolution within the limits of the mental scaffolding that is linear time, mm. like when you tell the, I know that it's, it's, it's a vital piece of that 13.8 billion year storytelling line. And, and there is this, past, present, future. Um, and it, the minute we say evolution because of our upbringing and training and cultural storytelling, it, it is still projecting a sort of perfection into the future and some form of imperfection in the present. We, we will be better then as we un- like I'm not saying you're saying that I'm, I'm, I'm just not. <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying that that's how it's culturally often understood. Mm-hmm. And and what, what I'm sometimes, I mean, this is this is conjecture, but but I feel um the very notion of time traps us to some extent in flip just as we can flip from understanding life through the storytelling of their individuals and their species, and the, the individuals are made up of units, and there's like DNA in there and all of that, yeah. Um, but we can also tell the story of the living process of life as a planetary process that has been seeded off from other processes that are probably going on in in many on many different planets throughout the universe. And um, in a similar way, and this relates to my mind to also the the, the sort of understanding of regeneration is it is that what we actually also could look at this as that everything is there always and it's basically transforming from within not in a sense that it's like it's it's a manifesting of the same perfection in different ways not in a kind of from this to that to that in the future but in a in in an immediacy, because when when you say that we are consciousness, I think the minute we get to that point of realizing that, time falls away. Time's it's just a it's it's a crutch to be able to think it. <laughs> but it, I, what do you think? Because I mean, Bohm was <laughs> very much reading Bohm for me was always a, a sort of like the, the the crux of Krishnamurti. Like it, it it seems that over and over again there are wise people pointing the finger at um, time um, as as one of our main flawed mental scaffoldings. Oh, 
this is such a great conversation because I do feel that it's a both and, not an either or. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, from my journeys, walking between worlds, 70 years or, or thereabouts, um, there is, you know, as a cosmologist, we can say, I would suggest, that we are having this conversation in a universe that began in terms of space, time, energy, matter, 13.8 billion years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was the first moment of what we call our universe. We're taught it's the Big Bang. It wasn't big. We know that. But it wasn't a bang. It wasn't a chaotic situation. It was incredibly ordered, amazingly fine tuned, which is why I call it the first moment of an ongoing big breath. And as space has expanded and time has flowed forward ever since, we can have this conversation with a scientific consensus that were we here or not, were human beings not evolved or not, our universe would still have had that journey of 13.8 billion years. It wouldn't have been called billion, it wouldn't be called years, but that journey of space time. And I think one of the things to say in that, and I think this is where Einstein's greatest genius was, was not realizing that space is relative to an observer and time is relative to an observer, but realizing that they had to be conjoined as space-time. And space-time, in scientific terms, in cosmological terms, is invariant. In other words, any observation by any observer, whether human or not, at any time, in any place of space, if that observation is of a, a, a measure that is three dimensions of space and one of time, then it's the same event. There's no dispute, there's no uncertainty and therefore taking time outside of human consciousness I think is what as a cosmologist I've been doing all my life mm -hmm. and that's how I can you know share and, and many 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 others can share this perspective of a universe that exists and evolves as a as a, as a finite story within which space time is uh, uh, both an observational but also an objective attribute of its realization and what we now understand from the holographic principle which is the direction of travel is that because it exists and evolves as a non-locally unified entity within space-time there is this arrow of time from the first moment because it began in its lowest entropic state but, and, it also knows itself as a wholeness and therefore non-local wholeness transcends those limitations of causality. So within our human consciousness, it's both and. We can have an objective perspective of a universe of space-time and energy matter where we are the sort of the holons, as it were. We are the the sort of the, the 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 seeds of its evolving consciousness, and we can ourselves, because we are naturally part of its non-local consciousness, have what you know we might call supernormal attributes, supernormal phenomena, intuition, synchronicities are all natural as part of this both and perspective of a universe as a cosmic hologram. But isn't it fascinating how much the word as scaffolding for thinking and languaging, like, what do we really mean with objective? Um, like, oh, yes. we, we're, we're talking about the story of separation and the story of interbeing, and on the other hand, um, the very way of thinking that freezes, like if, if for many people, the word objective creates a universe of things. I agree. And I think that's, that's this, you know, I talk about us having a dis-ease of separation. I agree. Mm -hmm. I don't talk about separation, but I do talk about unity and diversity or unity in belonging ultimately, but it is about differentiation. You know, the I Ching talks about in the, in, in the beginning there is the one not there was there is the one 
the one becomes two, the two becomes three from the three 10,000 things are born. So the whole point about a hologram and a cosmic hologram as a, as a modeling for our universe is that the whole is represented in its differentiated pixeled, pixelated parts, its holons that are not separate, that cannot be separate, but are in, but are differentiated. Mm. And that's I think this is this is the key point, isn't it? But we need to 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 wake up to remember we're inseparable, but we are differentiated. And that is the beauty. But, 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 isn't, but isn't it? I mean, this what, what I think is part of this understanding is to understand is like Santiago theory of cognition um perspective that it is in the act of distinction which creates the conscious cognitive world self that the separation shows up um and and it isn't necessarily real it's 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 our mental framing that make makes it show up like that but so 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 the the, the individual and the environment are one but they're, they're two through the act of distinction. So it, it's a link between consciousness and matter, which which I think you, you're also talking about. And it's like, I find that science, like for example, from, from the physics angle, the, the Alan Aspect experiment um, is something that is fundamentally blowing the story that is the current, like maybe not in the current edge of science, but you, the, we, we need to, kind of highlight, I think, in this, that you have science and the cutting edge of science, and then you have science education in university, and then you have the lag of generations of teaching and learning that what is being taught in schools is still a very primitive story of physics that, 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 that has nothing to do with current physicists. Well, not nothing, but 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 it is, it is like what... what Goethe called the historicity of science. Like um, it's it's this perpetuating storytelling in with sometimes unsufficient um, metaphor and like the because the, the danger like and I, I know we're ultimately seeing seeing it the same way. This is like yeah. Yeah, that, that's why I'm finding this conversation so interesting. But the the danger of even talking about unity, it brings notions of wholeness, and then wholeness bring notions of additiveness, like a whole build, being built up as the sum of its parts, rather than the whole manifesting in diversity through exactly. Um, exactly. the of exactly. meaning making. Yeah. Um, so they, they like the Botov talks about this as as um, as a kind of hermeneutical circle that the whole thing shows up through the the perspective taking and In, inevitably it does but what i would say I, I think to a number of things to respond to what you just said first of all alan aspect has just been given the nobel prize for physics seriously seriously Wonderful. as has, an, as has anton zellinger as has john clauser they were given the 2022 nobel prize for physics the three of them, which means that non-local, universal non-locality, what I'm writing about, is now settled science. So I didn't know that. I mean, because that experiment, for those people who haven't, I mean, <laughs> you're the physicist. I'll give you, I give my simple version and then you tell me if it's right. But it's it's a like one of those collider um, where, they, where they split a particle into they create well they create a twin particles essentially yeah, and, and, and one of them spins one way and the other spins the other way and then it travels out on this arm and when one passes through a really heavy magnet it reverses spin and instantaneously the other that is a kilometer and a half away in in, in this accelerator um also changes and 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 that makes like again, it, it it also breaks the whole fascination with time because it shows. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. What it shows is that way back when the quantum physicists were realizing that you cannot separate an observer from an from an observation. Yeah. There's there's a, a rule called Bell's inequality, mm -hmm. and that means that for quantum mechanics to work at all, 
the whole universe has to be fundamentally entangled, non-locally unified. But for years, that was a thought experiment and it was a sort of theoretical, oh, let's push that away. <laughs> we don't really want to get into this. But a lot of the technology over the last few decades have, has relied on, on non-locality to, to, to work. And Alan Aspect was one of the pioneers, as you know, in experimentally showing this idea that you've just described of when you create twin particles, you can separate them however far away you can separate them and you switch the properties of one and the other will immediately switch without any signaling going between them. Now, that was what Einstein at way, way back didn't like. It was one of the it was one of the predictions of quantum physics. Bell's theory said it had to be universal for quantum physics to work at all. But Einstein called it spooky action to distance because in his physics of space and time, nothing could go faster than the speed limit of light within space time. What we're realizing, it's a both and. That within space time, what we call space time, nothing can go faster than the speed of light, but the appearance of our universe of space, time, and energy matter is not its fundamental reality. It's it, The appearance emerges from a deeper non-physical realm of causation and intelligence, cosmic mind, Einstein would have called it. But the reason that this is so important, that universal non-locality is so important, is that it shows that our universe exists and evolves as a unified entity, that knows itself through its whole journey of consciousness and conscious complexity. But within space time, there is causality. There is a cosmic speed limit, the speed of light. But that realization of the both and was what got Aspect, Zellinger and Klauser, the Nobel Prize for Physics in 2022. So it's now settled science, but it's not an either or, it's a both and. And just to sort of finish on this topic, because it's so cool, I love it, is that um, in 2018, and this is what I, this is an experiment that I write about in the story of Gaia, teams at uh, a number of universities, including MIT and including Anton Zellinger, were able to what's called entangle, which was the description you were giving of this, this twin particle switch, we're able to entangle photons of light in the laboratory with starlight from 600 light years away with the whole of that entanglement triggered by light from a, a very active galactic nucleus called a quasar 12.2 billion light years away. So we now have experiments showing non-locality at cosmological scales, the theoretical underpinning, which is what I write about in the cosmic hologram, which shows that the appearance of space, time and energy matter in complementary ways emerges from this deeper levels of causation, this non-local causation to create a universe as a great thought, as it were, that within its journey of evolutionary uh, complex from simplicity to complexity, Time is the unfoldment of that. And we can talk more deeply about this, but it all hangs together when it's a both and. What I find what that just made me think of um, is something that I would love your, your, your take on. Um, because when it comes to regeneration and... Um, the capacity for systems to move into higher levels of complexity, higher levels of um, bioproductivity and abundance. Um, there's a sort of cold physics story that is the second law of th thermodynamics um, that ultimately the universe is running down. But then there is a warm physics or biology story that shows that at least in localized places like a planet like Earth, life, that planetary process, can be understood as a syntropic 
process as a as a, as a process and 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 the, and the resolution for me of of uh, how can we have the second law of thermodynamics and still have this narrative is that one of the things that that we somehow don't do nuanced enough is to understand that the time scales of the story you're telling when you're telling the universe story and the time scales that you're telling when you're telling the story of life on planet earth mm. are quite significantly different and that for in in the sense that you can still have across the universe whole the holding of the second law of thermodynamics. But in localized planetary situations, you can actually have a buildup of complexity. How 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 is that view different from the, the one that you're exploring? It's very different, but it's actually very compatible. And I think it goes back to a misunderstanding of what entropy is. Mm -hmm. We often are taught that entropy is a process from order to disorder that un un flows over time. So through time, an ordered system will become a disordered system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so this is the idea of cold physics and the universe running down and all the rest of it versus warm physics of somehow on our planetary home, somehow in our body, that somehow is reversed. That is based on that misunderstanding. Entropy is originally Boltzmann's perspective of entropy was the microstates, the energetic microstates of a system. And sure enough, the energetic microstates of a system do increase over time. For example, if I take a pack of cards just out of their packet, they're very ordered, low entropy. I throw them up in the air. They go everywhere. I pull them back together. They, they're not ordered anyway, but it's not that they're disordered. It's just that microstates are more than they were when they came out of the pack. So the energetic microstates of a system increase. And that was the initial notion of entropy. That's been, again, evolved significantly over the last few years, really. And the wider understanding of, of entropy now, and, and which is why I don't call it entropy, E-N, because that's energetic stakes, but entropy, I entropy is the informational content of a system. Mm. Okay. So within our universe began in its lowest informational content. As time has flowed forward and space has expanded ever since, more and more and more informational content has been expressed within mm. what we call space time. And that correlates with the idea of our universe or the appearance of our universe being essentially a cosmic hologram, a holographic projection from what we call the boundary of space-time. So at the Planck scale, which is the most fundamental scale of our universe that would drop out of any scientific explorations by any civilization able to do so, is the essential pixel pixelation of reality itself. So at every Planck scale time and every Planck scale area our universe or the boundary of our universe expands space expands time flows forward now the point of that is that when you have what are called dissipative systems such as planets and people yeah it's not that entropy or entropy is reversed the informational content of our universe is one way such just as the entropy is it's just that entropy is a bigger concept than entropy and it makes a lot more sense when we're talking about uh, a, a living conscious universe yeah so within planets these are subsystems of course and it, let's, it, let's it, talk it, about it, Gaia briefly so I make, make a connection or there isn't one yeah but also related to Ilya Prigogine's um, islands of coherence uh, in the sense that the, it the, is it is, but it goes far beyond Pritagene. Because yeah. he didn't, Pritagene, bless him, he did something, I mean, we all stand on the shoulders of giants. And what he showed was exactly that, these islands of coherence. But he was still working from that sort of old perspective of, of entropy, rather than this new understanding of entropy. And, and with regard to entropy, as you're saying, that, um, 
where you at as a physicist with i mean i i'm increasingly alarmed with how technophilic we are as a i agree um as a, a civilization and what you just gave me is a, is a, is a deepening of a framing that i've been trying out a little bit in 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 in, in conversations because it for me for me this obsession with ai just as a thought experiment if we are expressions of a fundamentally interconnected dynamic whole that has been unfolding unfolding in bohm's terms um for 3.8 billion years and entropy the cumulative amount of information stored in the differentiation and increasing complexity within this whole that is in many ways just more structured not not separate in any way just uh, this information has structured it over time and created the relational universe the mm -hmm. hologram um it's just ludicrous to think that fractional data set based on cold data and, and so on analyzed through algorithms and AI could match the NI, the natural intelligence that is stored within that dynamic transforming unity and diversity. It it, it just feels the wrong way to um, invest energy and it has the danger. I mean, that I just recently heard this alarming statistic that more than 50% of AI researchers believe that there is a 10% or greater chance that humanity will go extinct because AI will have the better of us. Um, yeah, well, how, how, where do you sit on, 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 on well, like the, in, in, the entropy as, as kind of information stored in the globe, like the cosmic brain so to speak um is so much higher than what we could do on a few bits and bytes exactly so i, I maybe take a slight step to the side and then come back at the, the the ai aspect of it because what i did in the story of gaia in fact i did it in the cosmic hologram i i shared a summary of how this all hangs together and i called it a new in sight of informational science and not to go any deeper into that, but to say that there's another step beyond entropy, which just as I add information with a hyphen, meaning meaningful information, as wholly expressed within our universe, which meaningfully exists, as I said, and, and purposefully evolves from simplicity to complexity, I, I add a, a hyphen into entropy to mean meaningful informational content of our universe which is all that is. I mean, I'm not saying that anything, I'm not saying anything is bereft of meaning. I'm saying everything is intrinsically meaningful. And we're part of this unfolding universe of this evolutionary impulse to ever greater levels of complexity and a realization through individuation of our interbeing, not just interconnectedness or interdependence, but interbeing. So everything in this perspective is a universe where mind and consciousness aren't what we have. They're literally what we and the whole world are. So in that sense, nothing's artificial. Mm -hmm. What we have created is a technology that we're calling AI, and we have created it. But it's potentially a technology that's actually showing us back to us, reflecting back to us what we're now sharing. So what is that and if we still are in a worldview of separation and where consciousness is something we have rather than what innately we are and not just we the whole world is then what is what we call now ai you know for me everything in our world is sentient everything so to, to different degrees to different degrees because of self-awareness yes but, but, but that's that's the, the, the i mean on the one hand again this is really resonant with insights that i got through the 
the Goethean angle yeah. uh, because Goethe um, wrote well, 170 years ago um, or longer that um, who doesn't see nature everywhere sees her nowhere in the right light. Yeah, I and I've I've meditated on that insight a lot, and particularly with regard to technology. Um, kind of again coming from a physics or biophysic dynamic angle, um, it just doesn't make sense to other something to the extent that it is not life, not exactly. evolution. But, but that, but I, I say that, and then at the same time, I say, Oof, watch out with that framing, because we are so technophilic that that will play exactly. into the mind of exactly. the narrative of, of mad people like Ray Kurzweil and Hans Moravec um, and, and the uh, Singularity University that, that literally perpetuate this narrative that we are the last carbon-based life form. We're going to download consciousness onto a microchip and then be robots who live forever after. And they literally think that it's like, Ray, the chap that takes too many. I, I agree with you. Um, I agree with you. Because yeah. I, I guess the other thing of this, you know, this perspective is that we have, we are so much more than we think we are. So yeah. much more than we think we are. And we're innately as, as individuated awarenesses of our whole universe have access to that awareness which is what of course the the ancient traditions of, of mystics the vedic sages the rishis perceived so we have supernormal as it were attributes they're not paranormal they're not supernatural but we have them and we're hardly touching the potential but, of but, our awareness but, 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 but that's yeah i mean but the thing is how do you I mean, we know, you said the, about the Vedic traditions, I mean, there, there are world wisdoms traditions that have tried uh, through practices to get people into states that made them aware of that non-duality of consciousness and matter and their non-duality of, of self and world, the Tatswatam. Again, that, it, also very often about time. <laughs> um being one of the just phenomena that how the whole thing shows up but but how would we really fundamentally understand our own lives in a day-to-day -day living if we like we, we started this conversation with me sharing a little bit about how I, how I realized recently that that um I've actually been going through 18 months of depression and that I needed some way to come out of that and, and found it now and and how fundamentally different the world now shows up for me um if we really take that worldview to heart then what happens to us in our lives well is, is yeah. to some extent um living out a larger story that we then try to storytell into this e egoic, limited individual or the journey of Daniel Wahl from birth to death. Yeah? But, and, and, and like, I'm, I'm just wondering to what extent when we flip this through science now, this perspective that how would we live if we realize that what we are is life living through us, not some sort of driver in the driver's seat. Uh, um, and how would we take on whatever happens to us as a because right now so many people are we were talking about this earlier many people are burned out uh, or, the, or they're depressed because they know too much about the state of the world and can't see um, a way through what we've created as a species um, at the same time I feel like a, there's a huge shift happening in the world at the moment and and almost everywhere you look, people are confronted with the breakdown of patterns that no longer serve on their personal level, in their relationships, in their communities, in, in um, politics and governance and in, in, um, finance, uh, economies. Literally, there's a world crumbling around us. And another scientific perspective, at the edge of chaos, the system is at its most creative. The, the, in this breathing in and out of the of, of complexity transforming, 
you need these moments of dissolution of patterns that no longer serve so the next first time right perfect pattern can emerge um how do you see see that relate to all this well <laughs> absolutely i mean first of all i part of what the work i've been doing really based on the science of cosmic hologram and the story of gaia is to work with many folks who have come to this perspective too where you know we have a worldview of separation it's a dis disease of separation in their own perspectives they've come to a realization or an understanding or an experience of, of wholeness of, of unity and diversity and um, a couple of years ago I got together with about 150 of these folks who've been working with the United Nations for many many decades and working on the sustainable development goals and realizing the siloed approach to them, realizing themselves that they're interdependent and interconnected, but nonetheless, that the way that they've been moving out in the world is 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 really, you know, taking the pre the prevalent worldview, the prevalent paradigm, of uh, and trying to 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 make it better, um, and realizing that also as a species, as a human species, we tell stories. You know, our stories, our, our narratives, our, our worldview is is really what, what moves us in terms of how we behave, how we experience the world. As you said, Daniel, you know, you've come to a, a, a real turnaround. The world shows up for you very differently now than it did 18 months ago. And that is true of many, many, many different people, I think, now are, are sort of turning around and realizing this. But these folks that I was working with, we drafted um, something called a unitive narrative, which is founded on the science of, of wholeness, but is really converging its perspective, this perspective, as a, as a sort of cosmological, planetary, societal basis for to serve, hopefully, transformational change. And that was brought forward by these change makers and is now being taken up by number of other organizations around the world is an underpinning and framing for what they do but three things to add to, to to this from this unitive perspective this unity and diversity perspective is first of all late last year at middle of last year each year the united nations has a high level political forum in july and i was invited to present this understanding with others to a group of organizations and, and uh, NGOs and UN affiliates. And from that gathering, by late last year, 16 such organizations founded, came together to present to the United Nations uh, um, uh, uh, a pro uh, to, to, to create what's called a unitive thematic cluster. And that was adopted by the United Nations last December, I think it was. So for the first time in 77 years, the United Nations adopted a grouping of organizations founded, underpinned, and framed by this unitive narrative. And now a number of economists are working together to see how we might draft a unitive economics that goes beyond even the regenerative economics, that goes beyond, you know, all the pioneering of economics now, which are whole systems economics, to these absolutely foundational understanding of wholeness and also unitive education. So I'm working with folks across the world. You mentioned earlier about education to bring this unitive understanding into, into schools, into universities, et cetera. We don't have time for that historicity to slowly, slowly, slowly catch up. And the reason I'm realistically optimistic <laughs> goes back to what you were saying about the way that Gaia has evolved. Because every time there's been a breakdown in biological terms, there's been an incredibly rapid breakthrough. And that rapid breakthrough, those rapid breakthroughs, have required enormous, radical, convening and horizontal gene transfers to create incredibly uh, rapidly more complex um, evolutionary arcs. And so what I'm suggesting now, where we're talking, I hope, about our conscious evolution, 
rather than our biological evolution is instead of having these incredible convergences of horizontal gene transfer, that this is a horizontal meme transfer. These new ideas that people get such an existential, experiential, a harness and a realization of that I feel could, you know, can transform our, our evolutionary arc in an incredibly rapid time frame. Yes. Uh, on many levels, I resonate, but I also listen between the word use and the the, the perspective. That again, not saying you're saying this, but in terms of how people um, could misunderstand it. I find it dangerous to like there's a current misunderstanding of regenerative as some sort of a new adjective that people are now talking about for I, I agree with replaced you replaced by another adjective and then another that's that's our kind of how we build our fodder for our neophilia but if the way I understand um regeneration is as a core impulse of life itself that has, and I have a wonderful conversation with Fritjof Kapra around this, um, of, of how basically regeneration is the essence of life self-organization. Um, and and for me, the danger of the narrative that, that sort of speaks about there's life and gene transfer and that kind of illusion, and then there's a consciousness and meme transfer is to, which is the, the to my mind, the, flip side, dark side, um, uh, um, blind spot of the conversation about development and evolution that is sort of the spiral that goes up. Yeah? Um, that it suggests that all of this doesn't need the imminence in life, that it has to be an embodied, not a transcendental consciousness that 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 like because otherwise we're getting dangerously close to the Kurzweilian thing no uh, that, that's uh, absolutely okay. uh, yeah, good absolutely not what I'm saying at all and I am agreeing with you I I think for me the definition of life for me our universe in its entirety is a living entity mm -hmm. so in essence all the things that I'm sharing is of that life organizing you know i i have a, a going back to language when we talk about self-organization who is the self that's organizing and mm -hmm. so i don't tend to use that terminology because for me it is our universe which is life itself mm -hmm. organizing and 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 evolving and regenerating and experiencing and exploring mm -hmm. this incredible yeah. journey that we're all part of that that is the the that's the Bhagavad Gita, the 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 seer and the inner one, uh, um, and and I mean that th this is the the fascinating journey that also like Fritjof in his his life, um, like first being a physicist and then because living in California at the right point of <laughs> all the hippies talking about the ancient wisdom, um, like writing the the Tao of Physics as a as a kind of showing that we've been grappling with this for a long time and that we've we've called um ancient wisdom and knowledge about our participatory the participatory nature of our universe and the bridge between the observer and the observed we called it primitive because we were so enamored with our reductionist modern science and and i find that's still something that we need to really watch out like on the one hand it's 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 this fine tightrope the both and the the embracing the paradox um that that is important to foreground that like it is possible and useful because it creates impact to, to tell this narrative through the scientific storytelling and the scientific evidence and, and everything but it's also um there, there, there are other of course wisdom traditions that have had a dynamic participatory understanding of wholeness and um, for whom uncertainty, not knowing and the paradox of having to be in 
participation, having agency in this, like uh, the, the paradox of having to act in the face of not knowing what the effect of our actions will actually provo uh, uh, provoke. Um, that's a deep, humbling insight that, that yes. everybody who had to live as custodians of ecosystems in place in our species history learned the hard way um, and made sure to pass on from one generation to the next that humility. And and I feel like we're really in danger of, of um, spoiling this wonderful evolutionary journey with, with our hubris that we think we can technologically solutioneer ourselves out of this mess. I agree with you. I wholeheartedly agree with you. And when you say we, I, I there's, an, there's an interesting it's, point there, I think. There's an interesting point. Who is we? Because this is not you and this is not me. This is not what you and I are doing. And, you know, I've, in my life, long life, I hope I've learned never to speak for anyone else and to realize that only I can make my choices. And this is the choice I'm making to, to share in the way that, you know, we've, we've shared today. Um, and for me, it's all that you say. It, it's, it's science, I think, is, is, is a really helpful way of exploring the nature of reality. And it has its limitations. And that's why in all my life, all my life, has, you know, interwoven not just the ancient wisdoms and the and indigenous teachings, but my own experiential explorations of all of this. And what that's brought me to is a perspective for myself that I don't see it as a paradox. Mm -hmm. I see it as a multidimensional parallax. Mm -hmm. yeah. In mm -hmm. other words, I'm, I'm you know from very different directions. And I guess what I'm inviting in in, in what funny. I share is is that an invitation of, of that adventure. It's and a lovely the, framing, the para, multi dimensional parallax. I'm going <laughs> to. <laughs> because you're right, it's, it's an adventure. There's so much not know, no thingness of it, not knowingness of it. And yet, for me, there's a wondrousness of it mm. and, and an adventure of it. And I do feel that, you know, we stand now at the bow wave of our universe together. Mm. And, you know, we are here as its microcosmic co-creators mm -hmm. in many ways, it seems to me, to serve its potential going forward, its re-continuing regenerative unfoldment and potential going forward. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I do feel very, I, as I say, I, I'm, I'm a realistic optimist. I'm an optimistic realist. But I do feel that you said earlier, Daniel, there is so much of a shift happening now. And so I, I, my sense is it, it, it behoves myself to serve that in whatever way I can, not in any impositional sense, but to serve and to invite and, um, and to share. <laughs> Wonderful. I mean, one, one thing that I've really taken away from this lovely conversation, thank you for it, um, is that as we collectively move forward in this exploration um, to at any point in time be mindful that when we say object objective time um all those all, all those things like i mean basically the work of of um george lakoff and linguistic framing um that that second level level observation of understanding that we say the same word but we not necessarily mean the same thing when we're hearing it and that that is so linked to education and it's wonderful to hear that you're involved with with this united nations impulse of taking things into education in that way is is like we really literally need to um slow down our explanations of these things enough that we do a loop when the word objective or subjective comes up and we kind of nuance it in that both and way that doesn't dismiss but also highlights the the danger the same i find it with unity is um on wholeness there there, there can be such loaded terms they're such important terms like the, 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 there's a lot that we haven't got to this time we need to have another conversation because i mean we talked about einstein but we don't, didn't talk about uh, young christian smuts and um 
holism and evolution. Yeah? We can talk about Schmutz, he's coming up to his centenary. Exactly. So yeah. Jan, Jan is, and now David Bohm is being appreciated far more than, than he was. Yeah, it is finally like uh, being being recognized as a pioneer of, of yeah. um, bioregional um, urban renewal um, and um, I loved you, like uh, Marilyn Hamilton shared your um, expansion of Geddes' um, Think Global, Act Local. Maybe we end with that one. Tell, tell, tell us about that yeah. one. Um, well, at, at Whole World View, which I, I co-founded back in 2017, to really share all that we've been exploring today, not just its understanding, but to serve its experiencing and, 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 and embodying. And we came up with that expansion, so Act Local, feel global and think cosmic <laughs> because you know this is the whole cosmos flowing through us and so it's it's huge it's vast and it's intimate wonderful thank you so much this was a lovely conversation and i hope we'll meet in person sometime let's let's go for a walk in mallorca oh yeah. that would be you wonderful know. i'd love thank that thank you daniel thank you so much lots of love bye lots of love bye for now